Good evening. Um, we asked for this appointment as a result of last uh, watching last we week's uh, meeting of the Board of Selectmen. <coughs> we had previously sent you a response to the inquiries that were have been sent to us by the Board of Selectmen regarding Mackinson and Company, regarding issues uh, associated with uh, the letter from the Attorney General's office, and I was aghast when the response was about the, the methodology we used in responding rather than the content of what we responded. And so we received a letter from Mr. Welch earlier this week, last week, and I've responded to it, and I have that to hand out to you at the conclusion of our presentation. But at this point, I would like to uh, let John Sovich uh, talk to you a little bit about the letter that we put together. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm John Sovich, one of the trustees. Um, if you'll indulge me for a few minutes, I think we'll get where we're going to go pretty quickly. I left town, my wife and I left town on the 23rd of November, and we returned uh, last Tuesday. Uh, we have kids down south, we headed south, um, we headed to uh, Pinehurst, North Carolina, where someone from Boston built a uh, New England village, kind of ironic that we went to North Carolina for a New England <laughs> village, and we live in New England, but that's what happened. So anyway, um, Mr. Donovan's letter caught up with me on Thanksgiving Day when I was at my son's uh, in Virginia. Um, when something like that comes in, I usually use a ready, aim, fire type of position. I look at it, try to read it, see if there's a problem, determine if there's a problem, and determine what must be done if there is a problem. I read that letter. I determined there were no time-sensitive concerns. We had already met with David Mays on the 19th of October. We had reviewed our investments. We had view, reviewed and voted on our relationship with Mackinson. There were no solvency issues. The funds were not impacted and they were safe. I didn't know anything about the promotional material or who had seen it or if we were affected. That's one of the areas I didn't know for sure. Two of us uh, were not even trustees at that time. Myself and John Troiano were not even on the boards. So. <clears throat> even if the other trustees had seen the material, it didn't require immediate attention. It could become a legal matter, and that could take a long period of time to solve. So I viewed it, I, I looked at it, and since there was no suspense, I determined the action could probably wait until I get back in, in January. I also viewed the letter as non-directive by its use of adverbs and modifying verbs such as should look, may wish to, perhaps seek, and might consult. To me, uh, and have uh, some, a little background in contracts, those are non-directive in their nature. So uh, since it was that, I determined I didn't contact anybody. I figured we would wait until we got back and had our meeting in, in January. From there, we drove uh, from Virginia to the New England village in North Carolina. Um, I received the, uh, your letter, the Board of Selectmen's letter, somewhere. It was published on the 14th. And I probably got it about the 17th or 18th of uh, December. I looked at the same type of things that I looked at in uh, Donovan's letter. This letter took a non-directive letter from the Charitable Trust Unit and tried to make it mandatory. It implied that we had taken no actions. It made false assumptions. It asserted the Boston's authority where none, ex uh, the uh, selectman's authority where none existed, and quite frankly, it ticked me off. So uh, I'll just go over a few things, and then we'll get on to where we're going to go. I don't know who wrote it, but the first thing I noticed is uh, on, on the second line, the selectman shall be responsible to ensure the safeguarding. Someone. Uh, 
left off the internal control procedures, which is uh, quite common. Next one, uh, that it was a fact intensive and we needed an inquiry. Again, there were some, some letters left out without any ellipsis. I had also told us to date you had not sought to consult with town council. Well, that's probably because on the, oh, I have an email from the town council that said, Norm, the following email from you, from me to you from November 5th, copying the trustees, made it clear that I do not represent the trustees in the SEC, SEC issue as I already represent the Board of Selectmen. Accordingly, your emails to me are not privileged and are the equivalent of communicating with the Board. It further went on and say, in light of my representing the Selectmen, I cannot advise you how to interpret the Board's letter to the trustees dated December 14, 2015. Although I believe the letter is clear and straightforward, if you need clarification, I would suggest you write to the Board of Selectmen. Okay, the letter also states uh, we should look at your returns and perhaps seek a meeting with Mr. Mays. Uh, that occurred on the 19th of October in open session uh, a month before we even got the letter from Mr. Donovan. Solvency issue. I looked at all our investments. I downloaded the investments that we had from the website, went to Morningstar um, by way of uh, the library here and looked at every rating on every investment that we had. There were no proprietary investments to Mackinson. Solvency wasn't an issue. The board should have known it wasn't an issue. You have uh, a finance director to whom we have sent all the reports since July. We have sent every prospectus for every fund we own. It would be very easy to look at that and say, there is no solvency issue. They don't have proprietary funds. Down towards the bottom on page two to commence the action items as set forth. Um, even Director Donovan by phone on the December 4th said his letter only recommends the trustees reevaluate their relationship with Mackinson. It's not an order. I spoke today with uh, Terry Knowles at the same division who told me that they don't have the authority to direct. They were merely suggestions. She had written the draft with Director Donovan. So that was uh, her advice to me today. Um, and then, you know, before we, we get to the meat of why we're really here, no letter would be complete without bashing Warren Mackinson, and that letter certainly does. Um, I've known Warren for over 30 years. He's a graduate of the Naval Academy. He's a duty, honor, country type of guy. The AG's ruling back in 2010 was that he had a conflict of interest because it could be used to his, his company's promotional material. It wasn't because he did anything wrong. It was because he might have the ability to use it in his company's material. The latest thing with the SEC, Warren probably made a mistake. I, I don't know. I assume it was. The SEC found that there was some problem with his promotional material. He didn't go out and start a Ponzi scheme. He didn't uh, take widows and orphans money. He made a mistake. And, and that's it. He paid dearly for the mistake and he continues to. But I think rather than bashing Warren Mackinson, I saw the latest numbers today. Uh, over the last five years, under um, with his company, these trustees uh, have put $3.2 million back into the taxpayers. Finally, we get to the letter of uh, what we had last week. I said we got back on Tuesday. Um, I saw where the selectmen met on the 4th, 
and I got a Dear Selectman email in the afternoon that came from Mr. Welsh's office looking for emails and uh, the right to know law. I immediately uh, got onto the Hampton Union website to see what was going on and found out that in the evening before there were certain uh, things said. Somebody said we violated the right to know law. They either had a meeting or they were doing it behind closed doors. So uh, the town's attorney said the uh, six-page letter was detailed enough to suggest the town the trustees took action in organizing the response the fight, despite the fact the trustees had not hold, held a public meeting since October 19th. I took a look at the request and something jumped out on me. Um, and I don't know how the town operates, but we got a letter from town council, we got a letter from selectmen, but both of the, the right to know laws were out of Mr. Welch's office. And I don't know, that kind of hits me strange, um, but that's where they came from and not out of, out of the council. So I went to the Attorney General's website, and on there there's a document, it's a memorandum of the right to know law, and it kind of explains a little bit better than the RSA does. And if you look at that document, it said what constitutes a meeting of the public body. And essentially, a public body holds a meeting when a quorum of the membership of the public body is convened in person so that all members may communicate contempor contemporary, well, contemporary contemporary contemporary. contemporaneously. <laughs> and, and the reason for being there has to do with a matter over which you have public use. They then, then go into an email, and it said, email should be used carefully limited to avoid an inadvertent, albeit, uh, meeting where there is a failure to have a physical quorum. Simultaneous email sent to a quorum of a public body by a member discussing proposing action or announcing how one will vote on the matter within the jurisdiction of the body would constitute an improper meeting. So would sequential emails. That would be an improper meeting. One-on-one -on -one emails, not so. Um, we were asked to provide all our emails. So. There are some, I don't know, uh, whoever signed that uh, request last week, uh, there are some emails or emails there that do not fall under the uh, right to know. <clears throat> so how did we get to the letter? It's very simple. I wrote it. I wrote it myself. I wrote it in the village in Pinehurst, North Carolina. I communicated with no one no one from the board, not Mr. Silberdick, not these two gentlemen here, no one. And I'll tell you why I wrote it. It eventually needed to be written. There needed to be a response somewhere. And I did it to jumpstart the process. And I also did it because it upset my wife. It upset her as we walked around Pinehurst, the village of Pinehurst, and this letter had come in, and we had discussed it previously. Our normal daily walk turned into more of a heated discussion. And I could see that she was concerned. And she finally asked me, are we going to be sued? And I said, nope, I don't think we're going to be sued. But that's the best I can tell you. I did consult with three individuals, however, when writing this. The first one was a lawyer. At my own expense, I went and saw a lawyer uh, who, when I explained the situation, after the laughter died down of what we wanted to do, the lawyer said, in order to file anything for compensation, you have to show damages. By your own admission, you did not see the advertising material, the town was not harmed by investing with the advisor. I also contacted as advised by uh, Mr. Donovan and the board, I contacted the SEC. I talked to a special counsel or I conversed with a special counsel who told me 
We do not give advice of that nature, even though we were advised to contact them. And uh, you should contact the lawyer. I said, okay, that's fine. Finally, I talked to someone who's on the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, the Compliance Division. She told me of something called UDAP, an unfair or deceptive acts or practices. It's a three-part test. Essentially, it boils down to, she told me, it doesn't necessarily go across all um, federal agencies, but it's pretty common. They usually look at each other. And essentially, you must, uh, there must be a representation, omission, or practice that misleads or is likely to mislead the consumer. And since we had never seen that material, we obviously were not misled. So that's where we are on the right to know. As I said, I wrote it. I wrote it alone. I sent the first draft to Mr. Silverdick. I sent a second draft when I got a letter from David Mays that answered uh, the Mackinson material. Because up to that point, I simply said, I don't know. I don't know anything about Mackinson and the questions that you asked. Once I got that, I sent the final one to Mr. Silverdick, and I said, this is to jumpstart the process, do with it what you will. He sent it out to the rest of the board, that was the first I saw on the 28th of December, and on the 29th he sent it to you, you gentlemen. And that's the story of the right to know and how that article got written. Thank you. I did not, when I received that letter and I sent it out, <coughs> I advise the fellow trustees that this is going out and if they had any comments they should respond to me. I received comments from Steve and John. They're attached um, to an, another letter I'm going to give to you now that responds to Mr. Welch's latest letter to us. And hopefully tonight will be the end of this. Um, first of all, I'd like to let you know as chair of the trustees of trust funds on a routine basis i actually have operating responsibilities i schedule meetings i disseminate information to trustees i run the meetings i coordinate with the town on bookkeeping matters and then i interact with the press i respond to requests for information from the public other hampton boards and other communities i also attend seminars and communicate with our investment advisor and his staff there's nothing I'm aware of that limits these responsibilities and authorities. And if I'm exceeding them, my fellow trustees are able to clip my wings or replace me any time they wish. And I've been uh, chair now for the last five years. I do have contact uh, with individual trustees, and I do so in a manner that uh, does not create a quorum. And I never deal with anything associated with our investments, mostly dealing with administrative matters. And um, uh, so fundamentally, I, I asked David Mays to respond to the information on Mackinson and Company because only he could provide that information and some of it was confidential and that was indicated in the response. And you had asked us at a prior meeting to reconsider our decision on Mackinson and Company and to hold it and in, in, uh, to have our next meeting televised. And next Monday, and the ninth, uh, next Tuesday, the 19th, we're having our <coughs> meeting. It, I've arranged for it to be televised, assuming there is a <laughs> television function operating at that time. Yeah. And we are holding a uh, non-public session to review Mackinson, uh, David Mays, um, amongst the trustees because it's, uh, it's being held non-public because it could deal with his reputation, et cetera. And we have a series of questions that have been sent or criteria for evaluating his performance. And then after that, we'll announce what our, what our results are and the public and you all are entitled and invited to attend the meeting. And if you have any questions to ask at that time, you're more than welcome to ask them. Um, so I'll provide this, as I said, I'll provide this information to you. Uh, I also would like to sort of uh, finalize this by indicating that the trust funds generated $642,000 or 
worth of dividend and interest income for this year, about a 3.5% return. We had a very poor year with, the, with respect to the value of the portfolio, which declined due to the uncertainty in the marketplace, and that continues. However, we still have an unrealized gain of approximately 86000 Last year, we generated 696000 I've asked David for a reconciliation between last year's income and this year's because it's down a bit. There was a reimbursement of, of uh of, um, of fees that we paid Mackinson and company that were that were put into the wrong accounts, and rather than trying to do bookkeeping entries, they just reimbursed the uh, the town for the for the uh, money that was paid to them. And so I'll have that hopefully uh, by next Tuesday. We'll have an analysis of the difference. It's about thirty or forty thousand between last year's dividends and this year's. We did do several transactions, and we went into more into direct. Uh, investing in bonds versus uh, what we had been doing in the past. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll provide this to you, and if you have any questions, I'll be very happy or we'll be very happy to address them unless you gentlemen want to say anything. More yeah, normal. I do. Okay, go ahead. Can I just ask you, um, when you have your meeting, do you allow the, the public com to comment there? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. So do you allow the people to comment before you make the meet with <laughs> no. Mr. Mays? While we're, while we're meeting. If you have something to say, you, you can. Yeah, but say. I mean, I was thinking, uh, if you give the the public a comment to a chance to comment before you make your decision about Mr. Mays, because that is one of the problems here is uh, a lot of I think of what people are um, uh, from the a lot of the selectmen I know are concerned about all of the public that is getting in touch with them how they feel about Mr. Mays. Okay. I'm just wondering if you're getting a chance to let the public uh, ask questions or, you know, get the feeling of the public before you make your decision. Because that's a lot of what's based here at the Board of Selectmen is the response that we are getting from the public. You know, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, this is my fourth year of doing this. I can remember five people that have been at a meeting. Two of yeah, them are no, in this room. I know, and that and that is what happens, and that's what happens all the time. And then uh, for months afterwards, people say, "Well, I didn't know that I could comment or whatever." But uh, I am sure, probably, that's what will happen again. But I would think that it would be nice if people did have a chance to comment before you made your decision, and maybe people would come. I don't really know. Uh, well, we're having a non-public first, and we'll have our decision, and then we can we can uh, ask if the public has any comments, and then go back in a non-public. If that that might be a good idea, might might yeah. be the the best way to handle that, so that people feel that uh, that they have their opportunity to express themselves. Yeah, but we great. generally have uh, in our meetings, given the fact that so few people actually attend them. Mm -hmm. They can just basically sit around this table, and if you have some people we'll ask, you have a comment to make, and people are more than welcome to make them. And we sometimes you've had some very good comments. So. Oh, that's good. Yeah, good. Mr. Hartley. Yeah, I I like to um, get more to the crux of what I think this whole problem uh, stems from. It stems fr from the fact that we had a down year. Uh, it started in January. And it went through the first six months, it recovered a bit. And this past week, it's been down again. And I think people are concerned the fact that the uh, stock market is going down. But I think what you have to understand is right now we have five people elected to the Board of Trustees. And all five of these people have had extensive investment experience. We're professionals. And it makes a big difference when you have professionals dealing with your investments than if you have laymen. And I think in each one of your careers and businesses, uh, you've had people who are laymen, and they don't have the same point of view as you have because of your extensive experience in your profession. And we have the same thing here. Uh, in the past, we haven't had professionals as, as the trustees. When it started way back 25 years ago, uh, we had um, upstanding townspeople, uh, three of them on the board, 
and they were all well-respected people, but they were investment professionals. And consequently, uh, what they did was they didn't want to take any risk whatsoever. They invested only in CDs or treasuries that could never go down. And because they couldn't go down, they couldn't go up either. They just earned interest, and that was it. Um, if you can't invest in something that will go down, you can't make a gain. And what they did was they let the investments deteriorate on a dollar cost basis because of inflation. And they lost, I'd say, about $8 million doing that over 20 years. Now that we have professionals, we know the difference between in investing uh, for no actual losses versus no losses through inflation. And, and we have a uh, real check on what our advisor does because our advisor can't do a darn thing without us approving it. Now, what we do is we set the directions, and the board says 40% stocks, 60% bonds. And when the stocks go down, as they have this year, I look upon that as an opportunity. So I'm an investment professional, and because it's an opportunity, it means we take some of the bonds and reallocate them into stocks so that we maintain the 60-40 split. And then when the market comes back, as it always does, we have that 40% uh, in, in, in new investments that can go up real quick as soon as the market comes back, much quicker than if we hadn't done that. And so these are the things that investment professionals do and, and we can do. And, and we understand that the, the uh, in investing public uh, will look at their own investments and they will say, we have a time horizon based on when we retire or when we expect to die. Uh, this fund doesn't have a time horizon. This is an endowment. This is like Harvard University's endowment. It has no end. It goes on forever. So we don't have to worry about the fact that we have a loss this year um, that won't come back for another three years or whatever. Whereas some private person worries that they're going to retire when their stocks are way down and they have to sell out to live. And so we have a different point of view, and our point of view is based on the fact that we're professional investors, and we know how to do this, and we know the fact that the, the long time horizon that this uh, fund has uh, makes it possible for us to take advantage of that and, and invest in things. When they go down, we can take things from bonds and put them in stocks. If the, if the bonds go down, we can take things from stocks and put them in bonds. So when each one recovers, we're way ahead of the game. And so what I caution people to uh, understand is that we are five professionals, and we hire an investment advisor. And the investment advisor does what we tell them. Now, they do the details. If we say 40% in stocks, they make recommendations to what the 40% should be invested in. If we say 60% in bonds, uh, they make recommendations as to what they should invest 60% in. And then we approve that. And if we don't like what they do, we tell them to change it, and they do. And so, really, the investment performance is something that we're responsible for and not Mackinson and Company. Mackinson's Company just does what we do. We tell them to do. Mr. Chairman. And so I, I want you to uh, uh, understand that what people who are talking to you are basing their comments on their own uh, experience, and they're not necessarily professionals, and they don't have the same background that we do. So I, I want I want you to understand that that Magazine Company does what we tell them to do, and they charge us about one tenth of what other another firm would tell us because we did put it out for bid a few years ago, and Magazine Company was bidding at one tenth of one percent as their fee. Nobody else came even close to that. So we look upon the, the fee that we pay to Maxson as, as a bargain, and they, they do what we tell them to do, and they make recommendations that we adopt or we don't adopt. So I just want you to understand that as, as investment professionals, we have a different point of view than the general public. And I, I think that our point of view is superior because of our experience. Okay. May I, may I respond? Because 
you, Mr. Chairman, said why I responded, why I reacted to this thing, and Mr. You also said why I responded. It had nothing to do with performance. And the performance has been good. It had nothing to do with the performance. It had everything to do with integrity. And any company that I was going to be doing business with, and I think that the town should be doing business with, should have an absolutely impeccable integrity uh, at, um, record. And I think we talked about this, that there was a fine, that Mr. Mackinson was the one who did it, whether it's a mistake or not. He was a compliance officer. He was running the company. He owned the company. So a mistake, you throw it right out. The fact is there was a fraud or there was an uh, infraction, and it was fined for that infraction. Correct. When you came in to meet with us, and I'll tell you why my feeling, when you came in to meet with us, we talked about whether Mr. Mackinson was still on the board. And at that time, it was said Mr. Mackinson was not on the board, I believe. And we said, okay, and then it came to light that Mr. Mackinson is still on the board. He has nothing to do with the daily operation, but if you're on the board of directors, you do have something to do with the company. So from that aspect, it was simply a question in my mind of integrity, and I <clears throat> felt that a sooner meeting, an earlier meeting, would be good for the public to know transparently what was going on. Not that the funds were in danger, never felt that the funds were in danger, but I felt that there was an integrity question. And that back in 2010, there was a big question mark, and Mr. Mackinson had to uh, leave the board. Because, so there has been a question along, and that's what people have said to me. People have not talked to me about the performance necessarily or danger of the funds. They've talked to me, and people who know what they're talking about, and people who have been in town for a long time, uh, they've talked to me about the integrity, and is there a question of integrity? And if there is a question of integrity, it's not how well we're doing. Should we move on? Then move to the right to know law. We receive a letter that's on official trustees of the trust stationery. Okay. It's signed by Norm Silberman. Therefore, and in it, it says not my opinion. It says our, O-U-R, opinion. Therefore, the only assumption that I can make is that somehow each one of the board of trustees, that's their opinion. So there's some kind of a vote that had to take place for that letter to be put out. Now, your communication here, John, is very good tonight. It helps an awful lot. It might help if people didn't go to the newspaper all the time writing editorials and accusing people of doing things illegally. We never accused the trustees of the trust doing anything illegally. We came and said we have questions on these specific issues. We have a legitimate question on the right to know law. It's on official stationery, and it says our, O-U, our. Not my, not one person's, it says ours. The only interpretation I have from that is that a meeting took place or correspondence took place, or somebody is taking too much authority by saying our by speaking for the whole board without having a vote. That's, that's solely where I'm coming from, nothing to do with performance, nothing to do with professionals. I respect all of your opinions. I respect that you're taking care of the trust, that you're doing it there. But this has blown out of proportion, and I think it could have been handled a lot better from your aspect. We might have inflamed it also. We probably could have handled it a lot better. Definitely. But it was inflamed, and it was inflamed, I think, by egos get involved and... Uh, we don't have good communication. Jim, just to, to make mention, I have from uh, my training as, a, as an auditor way back when in the, in the 60s with Singer Sewing Machine Company, in writing memorandums, I had a very difficult time ever using the word I and tried uh, not to use uh, any pronouns. But in this case, <clears throat> I should have used I versus our. And I did because that's just my personality not... I'm not uh, ego driven to be doing but, but, that. But I think you can see why. Yeah, I can understand. I can it. see why we have a 91A, why we say that there must have been a meeting that took place. That's all I have to say. Did you want to comment to? I, I saw you there with your. I, I mean, the only thing I can say is I mean, I read the article Friday when we, uh, on Monday when we got back from Vermont, and it, it seems like an opinion had been formed between our town council and you, Rusty. I mean, it was kind of shocked especially by our town council, that, that an opinion had already been formed. Okay, well... That, that we had a meeting, that a, a meeting was held. So, 
that's what you would like to say. That's so, that's what that's all I have to say, Mr. Bridal. Yes, and 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 mine is the very reason that he did what he said that we it was our and it was signed by Norm. It wasn't signed by you. I appreciate what you come tonight and told us. I very much appreciate that. I appreciate how how the the funds have been going. But when we hear our and it was sent to the paper to us, yep. so the public's out there re reading it. Yep. The public doesn't see you guys. They come and talk to us. I'm in this town all, every day, all day. I see people all over the place, and they're going, we're reading about this in the paper. It's a trust issue. We have, a, a, I may be one of those laymen, but I hire a advisor. And I'll tell you, I wouldn't hire an advisor that they had a trust issue with. And so, and that's what we get. So when it says our, that's the problem. I understand. And it was sent to the paper. The paper got it. People came to me and said, what is going on? We hear these guys aren't meeting. They're not doing this. And by the look of this, you had a meeting. I understand. So that was that was what my concern. It did not have anything to do with the town attorney. I asked him about it. I said, look at this. So Let's go back, Rusty, and go back to your 14th uh, December letter. Uh, Mr. Donovan had already put out that letter. It was written to the trustees. It wasn't written to the Board of Selectmen. It was to the trustees and all the towns. Mm -hmm. Okay? When the 14th December letter came out, all it did was parrot what Mr. Donovan said. It underlined it and it <coughs> made threats that we're going to discipline you, we're going to do X, Y, and Z in that letter. I'm telling you, that's what upset my wife when we were walking around. Are we going to get sued? It was a letter. I don't know who wrote it. It shouldn't have been written that way. There should have been some other type of communication. It could have very easily been diffused if somebody called over to Donovan's office and said, are these directions? As I mentioned before, the verbs and adverbs used in there from contract language is not directive in nature. And as you just said, it was sent to you. That's correct. And we never hear, heard anything about it. As was the SC, the Security Exchange Commission, sanction sent to you, and you guys voted on it that night. You were in here that night talking to us, and you never once mentioned it. We didn't find out about it till afterwards. And then we found out about this afterwards. you got to hear our point, too. I hear I'm hearing point. from the public. I the hear public your point. doesn't appreciate it. I hear your point, and, and you're right. It, it should have been probably... There probably should have been a better communication, and we need to learn from that and the communication. But this idea of we're going to discipline you, we're going to do whatever it is, is just on call for. It gets everybody's rackles up, and we don't like that, and you don't like that. You don't like in public uh, for people to say things, and, and we don't either. So, I mean, if but we don't learn from that's this... That's where it has to be said. But if we don't learn from this, we're, we're going to do it all over again. So we need to learn from this experience. We need to put it behind us. We need to start back out. There was no um, violation of the public's right to know. I either can't remember honestly whether I wrote I or our when I wrote those drafts. I, I don't remember. I'd have to go back and look at the drafts. Perhaps I sent the draft to Mr. Silverdick. I said, here's a draft to jumpstart this procedure. Do with it what you will. That was it. That was the only communication that took place. And, and we understand that now, but you've got to see that it said our. I, I understand that. Our means a vote. And, and yeah, you know, I didn't see that. I was on the road. I drove from North Carolina to South Carolina, and I thought everything was hunky-dory until I got back up here, and all of a sudden I get a Dear Trustee email. Yeah. I go, what the heck is going on? I thought this would be over by now. <clears throat> so, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Welch, would you like to say something? I think it's all been said. Thank you. Mrs. Wolseley. Now, gentlemen, I want to make it clear that my signature on that December 14 letter should not have been there. I voted against sending the letter. But when we get a stack of stuff like that with little tags to sign, I admit I signed without as part of a, a lump. Um, I am getting calls from the public too and one call that uh, interested me greatly was from a lady who said we're sitting out here wondering why you guys are not 
um, disciplining or taking to task the trustees. And I said, well, you need to understand that the trustees do not work for the Board of Selectmen. The trustees are independent elected officials, and they are responsible, and whoever in the Attorney General's office is responsible for overseeing trustees of trust funds, it's their problem, not ours. I am very concerned that this has grown uh, way out of proportion. Uh, I think that the, uh, the letters and memos that have been sent to the trustees are insulting. Um, I have attended some of the trustees' meetings, uh, once with Mr. Waddell, when Mr. Waddell was present, and Mr. Jones is in the back of the room, and he was at another. And I have been allowed to make comments, and Mr. Jones made comments, and I can't remember whether you did, Jim, but you probably did. Uh, it's a very open type of meeting. Um, I, had, I had a message on my answering machine, end of August, from the um, administrative assistant saying, Mary Louise, the chairman has called a meeting uh, on, on September 2nd at 7 p.m. Can you make it? So I don't like to leave things dangling. I picked up the phone, and Christina's answering machine picked up, and I just said, I'm fine with tomorrow night. I'll be there. Um, then overnight I was thinking about it and I said I wonder what's going on because I hadn't had any other information from anyone so I called her back in the morning and I said what's happening why are we meeting tonight I can make it but why are we going to be there and she said oh it's about the trustees of the trust funds and I thought well that's kind of weird but I'll go so I went and I talked to uh, the uh, town council on my way into the meeting and I said I'm not quite sure why we are meeting, but the trustees of the trust funds are independent elected officials, and I see no need for a non-public session under RSA 91. And town council said, oh, oh, we don't want to compromise people's reputations and damage their reputations and whatever. Now, I went on into the meeting, frankly, to see what was going on. And Mr. Griffin turned the meeting over to Mr. Bean, who had requested the meeting. And Mr. Bean mentioned something about not damaging the reputations of the trustees because they're all local men and they have... Uh, and by the way, the minutes are not sealed, although they are not mm. verbatim. And he said these are all local men and they have businesses and so forth and we don't want to damage anybody's reputation. But the next piece of paper that was passed around the table was a copy of an opinion piece that Mr. Silverdick wrote as a private individual. It was printed in the newspaper. That is irrelevant for a non-public meeting. Nothing was mentioned about any of the other gentlemen who are trustees, and I took that, quite frankly, as a longtime resident of this town and a longtime <laughs> public servant as a direct attack on Mr. Silverdick as an individual who happens to be a trustee. And I think that's inappropriate. And I mentioned to the board while we were in the meeting that we should not be doing that because I felt and still feel that that was an illegal uh, meeting, uh, non-public meeting. Uh, we, I think this has gone way overboard. I think this has bordered on or, or actually constitutes harassment of another public body. I think what has happened here is unacceptable, and I, for one, at this point in time, want nothing to do with it, but I caution this board, we should be keeping our noses out of things like this. We have no authority here, and if the Attorney General wants to go running around after boards of trustees in the state, well, let them do it. That is not our problem, and I am really, really appalled at, look at, look at all this, all this stuff. All this stuff. And they have done absolutely nothing wrong, and they are independent elected officials. And if they tried telling us what to do, boy, you'd be upset. Uh, I am. Are you finished, Mrs. Wolf? I am. Well, I am. Mr. B. Reading my remarks. Thank you. Um, we, we all have. And I'm annoyed. Here. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> thank you for coming in tonight. John, I'm sorry about your vacation. And nobody, nobody, nobody ever talked about a tort against uh, the trustees. You've uh, returned uh, great 
results for a lot of years. Last year was a hard year. You have uh, tens and tens of millions of dollars under management. It's not an easy job. Uh, where Rusty sits, where Jim sits, where Mr. Welsh sits, that's, that's not an easy job either. And uh, while um, sometimes we've exchanged um, uh, perhaps editorial comment or comment in the newspaper, uh, it has never been about uh, an ad hominem issue. It's never been about personality. It's been about safeguarding uh, $21 million. It's been about living up to our responsibilities under RSA, under the town of Hampton, and under state law. And I could read um, John Triano's uh, email that he sent to you on the 28th and continue to, to, to stroke this flame and, and, and do those things. I know the board and the majority feels very strongly about their, their, um, their looking into this matter. And uh, Mr. Silberdick, Mr. Chairman, you say rightly, would like to move past. Uh, and that's notwithstanding Jim's comments and Rusty's comments, and that uh, federal, federal regulators and state regulators have had an interest in it. But for the good of the town and, and for the good of our collective efforts, I think it's important that we uh, recognize that there have been some um, actions that have come to the attention. I think it was only right that the Board of Selectmen raised those issues. There was an anonymous letter actually sent to me, and I knew nothing of this. And I would expect each of you, were you to receive that information, to do the same thing. And I would, I would expect any elected official to do it um, the way we have done it. But it has never been personal. Um, oftentimes, uh, these small town um, uh, politics, if you will, um, do get a little barefisted. And uh, I, I learned that first uh, hand on this board. And uh, sometimes it's not fun. <coughs> sometimes uh, the pay isn't that great. But you have done uh, a remarkable job in totality as, as trustees. And uh, I think it is important that, uh, um, that your board, through your chairman in one voice, uh, have better dialogue with um, the town attorney, with the town manager, and the chairman. Um, and I, I don't think there's enough of that. And that, that's just a suggestion. And I think it will um, uh, stop some of uh, this forward progress in rehashing and rehashing and he said and she said and he said and he said and he said because that's getting us nowhere and it is Hampton. So um, I'm looking forward uh, to moving forward collectively. I thank you for your service. And um, please tell Mr. Triano that um, uh, the board, I think, collectively um, may feel the same way. Thank you very much. Rob. I have a follow-up uh, question yeah. to the manager. Let, let other people speak. This You're always shutting me up. I have well, a I am shutting you up right now because I haven't had a chance to right, talk. But I have a we will come back to you when manager. it's your turn to talk. Thank you. Please, stop. Mr. Waddell, do you have anything oh. else to say? No, I've... Okay. And, you know, one of the things I would like to go into is I think one thing that does scare the public is just the whole idea that it's a $100,000 fine. You know, when people hear that, they don't hear anything else except right. that. And that's why people may be questioning. Um, I just wanted to say uh, that when Mrs. Woolsey was pontificating about what was going on at the, at the private meeting, um, the only reason that the private meeting was held, as far as I'm concerned, although it was done at the request of somebody else, was to protect your reputations. And... Um, Mr. Mays and Mr. Uh, Warren Mackinson. That's the only reason why I would have. And I personally, I feel bad about your wife because I'm pretty much every, sure that everybody here has felt that at some point at the beginning of their service to the town or whatever. It takes a while to get to realize exactly how it all works. And um, I'm sure your wife must have, you know, that's she not fair. Okay. She was yeah. on right after a while. After I assured her we weren't going to be sued. So and she many kind of times, calmed down at that point. Many times I have to run down here the first thing in the morning to find out if, you know, if I've said something <coughs> that would cause me a problem. So those things do happen. But I think mainly um, that's the only, as far as I'm concerned, last week the vote was three and two extent. Uh, extent um, ex abstentions. Extensions. <clears throat> and the reason why I abstained is because I think it's overblown and I felt that way right from the beginning. But I still seem to be the victim of um, these letters in the newspaper that don't reflect my position at all. So that I feel bad about. 
And but I I'm over that. I don't I don't even think about it anymore because it's happened for years. Well, it's kind of that way when you're on a board. You're the board of yeah, selectmen or you're a trustee. But as, as to the fine, I have another one that I have in here, and it's a very almost exactly the same as Mackinson. The gentleman lives in Wyndham, New Hampshire. He works out of uh, North Andover. It was adjudicated and done in uh, December 18, 2012. Two hundred thousand dollars for the exact same offense. <coughs> he hired a lawyer at fifteen hundred dollars an hour and reduced it to two hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So I was appalled at the first time when I saw a hundred thousand dollars. What could have happened? But you have to put it in perspective. And I also need to say that David Mays was employed at the company at that time. And the SEC did not cite him, and that needs to be taken into account. We're going to meet next week. I get one vote, same as these gentlemen. My only allegiance is to do the right thing for the trust funds, for the town, and for the taxpayers. I can't be concerned with what people are saying. Somebody is not going to be happy next week, either our present advisor or the people out there that think we ought to move on to somebody else, and if we do or if we don't, it's going to be, you know, we're in a situation where we're going to be criticized one way or the other, no matter what we do. And ultimately, people decide when they vote, and that's, I think, the most important thing. I feel kind of bad for Mr. Hartley because there's a lot of people that are probably going to blame you. And, you know, I'm sure that uh, you've done nothing wrong. But, you know, we'll see. It's, uh, that's how it goes in the votes. You know? This is my second time on the board, and both times they've been unopposed that I ran. There's not a lot of people out there. There's not the interest. Nobody wants to come in and be the spear catcher. <laughs> for God's God sake. That's the problem. He got more votes than <laughs> I did last time. <laughs> well, we're on the same cycle, and we were both unopposed the last two times. There is a seat open, as you said. My wife asked if it was mine. <laughs> I said, unfortunately not. No, it's not. But there's a seat open, and everybody that thinks they know how to do it better can go file. Well, that's true, and I'm all for that. Mrs. Walsley. Uh, according to the statute, the right to know law, um, if... Uh, matters which, if discussed in public, would likely affect adversely the reputation of any person other than a member of the public body itself. That would have been us. If they uh, wishes, such person may request an open meeting. Did anybody contact you prior to the meeting that we held that I was concerned was an illegal meeting? Anybody call you and ask to be heard at that no, meeting? No, ma'am. Uh, no, but I sent uh, an email. Mr. Silberdick was invited. Was were you invited? Yeah, I sent it at, at the last moment. I did send an email saying I prefer the meeting be held in uh, in public because if you had any criticism relating to our performance as trustees, you sent that to the board. Yeah, we Should you know we all I, and I always prefer that all the meetings be done in public, mm -hmm. but you just really never know what someone's going to say sometimes. And I think there was a lot. I mean, as far as someone's reputation, right. and as far as I'm concerned, I don't even want to go there. I don't like taking shots at people uh, in public, particularly here at the selectmen's meeting. And I do see it happen more often than I would like. Any other comments? I Thank you for not. coming in tonight. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. And I cry easily under criticism. <laughs>